Hola a todos, buenas tardes. Vamos a comenzar con el seminario de sistemas complejos. Bienvenidos, gracias por venir. El día de hoy tenemos al doctor Andrei Klishin, que nos va a dar una plática titulada Design Stress in Naval Ships and Chemical Potential of Equation Terms. Y les voy a dar una breve introducción eh, de su perfil que viene en su página. Eh, en primer lugar, dice, eh, he's a physicist working on complex systems, design problems, and human learning. He uses a combination of theoretical computational data tools, such as statistical mechanics, stochastic processes, network science, tensor networks, and, spur and sparse in theories. Uh, he's broadly interested in how data about complex systems can be encoded and manipulated in algebraic information structures in order to distill the physical principles underlying emergent collective behavior. He's currently a postdoctoral scholar uh, in the AI Institute in Dynamic Systems and Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Washington, working with professors Kritika Manoha and J. Nathan Kurtz. Uh, previously, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Complex System Lab at the University of Pennsylvania, working with Professor Danny Bassett, and he got his PhD in physics in 2020 from the University of Michigan, advised by Professor Greg Fernandez. In route, uh, he also got a Master in Science in Physics in 2017 and Certificate in Complex Systems in 2019 from the University of Michigan. He started his undergraduate studies at uh, Belarusian State University and transferred to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he got his Bachelor in Science in Physics in 2015. Entonces, fue de lo más reciente a lo, a lo primero, digamos, en su carrera académica. Y bueno, sin más, damos la bienvenida al doctor. Eh, bienvenido. Um, muchas gracias por la introducción. Déjame conectarme. Yeah, okay. Uh, y como la última vez, uh, yo voy a dar la mayoría de la charla en uh, inglés, uh, pero me pueden poner preguntas en cualquiera de, de los dos idiomas. Uh, yo voy a tratar de explicar lo que sucede. Okay. Um, so I have a, a, a talk for you about design stress and naval ships and chemical potential equation terms. I intentionally chose this title to be so so weird and and, and strange and try to have sort of physics words and not physics words because we don't talk about you know those things too often. Um, and only to, to motivate how I like to think about physics and what I think physics is and what is principally important about it, uh, starting with the level that should be accessible to everyone. Let me <clears throat> connect. Okay. Uh, we really like forces in physics. We believe that forces are so important that we insist on teaching forces and, and drawing diagrams like this to any student who takes a physics course, even if they don't want to have a physics program overall. Any engineer who takes intro mechanics has to, to uh, figure out how to talk about this. You have a block on an inclined plane, and you start to, to draw all the forces. You can have gravity, I have normal force, I have friction force. I add them all together, and, and, and you result in acceleration. And this is seemingly a very simple problem. Obviously, everyone here should know how to do the math for it. Uh, but I think it's very important to, uh, to understand that we kind of have a lot of sentimental attachment, a lot of interpretation to each of the forces that come up here. They all come from very different physical origins. We know that normal force uh, is, is from close by interactions between atoms. Gravity force is because we are in gravitational field of the Earth. Um, and so forth. And the number of forces is typically not very large. If you're trying to draw this diagram, okay, here you have three, maybe you have five, maybe you have seven, but you will never really have a hundred forces. Um, and this sort of depth of interpretation is what I think is, is so great about uh, sort of physics view of approaching problems. Um, of course, very often we talk about um, forces in terms of uh, potential energies, we say that force, for, for some forces, for conservative ones, uh, it is a negative gradient of potential energy, or maybe you have some sort of effective potential energy, like a free energy field, and say effective force is negative gradient of uh, effective free energy field. Uh, and this view is uh, very useful, for instance, in uh, problems in soft matter, as the saying really doesn't uh, react to me very fast. So for instance, there is um, this problem that Imagine you take a bunch of tubes and you put them in a 3D box. 
and you just shake the box, so the cubes try to maximize entropy, um, they're not allowed to overlap with each other, but otherwise they have no attraction against each other. Um, and these somehow end up forming this, this simple cubic lattice. And we're trying to understand, so why do they want to form this lattice? And I don't want to go into that uh, computation too much detail, but basically you can uh, figure out how to compute the effective potential energy against distance. So basically this is when the cubes are, two cubes are very close together. This is when they're very far apart. When the cubes are closer together, it gives more entropy to all the remaining cubes in the system. So effectively you have lower uh, free energy of the system in that case. So basically cubes end up attracting, right? You want to go down the slope of potential energy. I don't want to go into details of, of that computation. It would be a whole different story, uh, but I'm interested in, uh, so, so the, the lead author on this study, Greg Van Anders, uh, became um, my PhD advisor. Uh, no, I think, it's very good to switch to my own pointer because it's less into one. Oh, much better. Um, so Greg Van Anders uh, became my, my PhD advisor. He was a professor for a few years at University of Michigan where I was doing PhD. And afterwards, he moved to Queen's University in Canada where uh, he now works. And we still collaborate with him on, on a few topics. And he likes this phrase that force is an example of concrete abstraction. And concrete and abstract is kind of this, this two opposite uh, sort of ends of spectrum. And this is some, some weird intersection that we uh, can talk about forces with, with very concrete uh, interpretation. We can compute them numerically. We can uh, predict what a particular combination of forces will lead to. Uh, but at the same time, they're somewhat abstracted because I don't need to worry about ev what every single atom is doing. Uh, in, in my system in order to more abstractly understand what, what's happening on, on a force scale. So this is uh, sort of part of, uh, of what governs my, my philosophy of approaching uh, problems as a physicist would. The other part is going uh, beyond optimization in problems. So in, in a lot of uh, practical problems that we are considering, we're trying to uh, connect the design space, sort of the space of possible things that we can build, to the outcome space, to, to the functions that, that the things would perform. And I draw them here intentionally in, in a very uh, fuzzy um, manner. So, so here, note, I'm, I'm trying to come up with this weird mapping between two different clouds. They're very ill-defined. These are not mathematical spaces. They're not constrained by any laws of physics. That's like total wishful thinking. So at the top here, I can set myself a goal to build you know, perpetual motion machine or something like that. I don't know anything about physics. I don't know anything about what is possible yet. I only know about things that, that I want to achieve in uh, either designs that I'm considering or uh, the, the outcomes that are possible. Of course, in order to, and, and the question that we frequently ask is what? So what design should I pick for a given outcome or what outcome would I get from a given design? But of course, the moment we start trying to formalize it because here we're living in the cloud. There is no mathematics. There is there is nothing quantitative that can be said. If we want to start using mathematics, we need to map from those abstract, weird cloud spaces into sort of more well-defined boxes. We can uh, have a more well-defined box that we call uh, solution space and a box that we call objective space. Uh, and those are mathematical. Those are like okay, here is all the states in which I, I allow my system to be. Here is all the possible ways I measure the outcome. But once you start uh, doing this mapping, these mappings are necessarily optimal. Yeah, I, I have to throw something out from my wishful thinking. I have to also constrain myself to, uh, to you know, laws of physics and, and, and things that I know about how physics works. Uh, but once I do this mapping, there's a lot uh, more different questions that, that uh, can be asked. I can start asking why particular solutions are selected by particular objectives. Uh, I can ask how much does a solution, the numerical solution that I found, solve my original design problems that I was interested in. Um, I can ask what if the objective for which I am selecting, that, that is usually some sort of approximation of what I really want, uh, what if it doesn't match exactly the outcome that, that I truly want? Um, and this is sort of the sort of the second spirit in, in which I uh, approach a bunch of problems. So um, today, since uh, my, my talk has end, my talk has two stories. I have two stories to tell you. One is a story about ship design. Uh, which is mainly about why do functional units tend to cluster in naval ship design, and I will motivate why that is a problem that I care about. 
Uh, and the second question is, um, and, and that is work I did in, in PhD some years ago. And the second question is about system identification, which is when can you pull out a differential equation from observing a trajectory? Um, so let's start with, a, with the first question. Let's, let's try to design a warship. I was um, told that I shouldn't say to design a battleship because we don't build battleships because World War II has already ended. But basically, if you if you have an assignment, you need to design a battleship, a, a warship, correcting myself, and you sit down in a conference room with someone, and this doesn't sound yet like a physics problem at all, and you're like, okay, so you want me to design you something, what do you want from it? And I say, well, first of all, it needs to be as cheap as possible. It needs to float. It needs to keep floating after being shot at. It's, it's a warship. Uh, it needs to support our best current generation weapons. Also next generation and next, next generation. We don't know what they're going to be, but you have to support them anyway. Uh, you should be able to redistribute power. You should have mission flexibility. You should be able to fix the ship when it breaks and do something else and something else and something else. And the longer you're willing to sit in a conference room, the more requirements they're going to put on you. Uh, it, it, it's sort of like a never ending um, thing. And so how do we even start thinking about it? Well, first you need to ask someone who knows what, uh, how this works. So um, this is my collaborator from my PhD, Professor David Singer, uh, who is professor of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering uh, at University of Michigan, uh, who started telling us how they approach uh, those kind of problems. Uh, and one of his graduate students some years ago, this guy Colin Shields, uh, who had PhD 2017, I believe, in his uh, thesis, he needed to provide a definition of what design is, uh, which I think is, is very useful so, so we all know what exactly we're talking about. And so he said, after reading uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of other papers, he said, design is the act of generating knowledge for decision making through time. And kept reading it and reading it, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound too different from, from what we do in physics. So the, the act means you're trying to compute something. And specifically, I decided that I'm going to compute this thing and not this other thing because I have finite computational resources or finite you know, uh, human hours of work. I need to decide which parts of, uh, of the question I'm going to attack. Uh, it is something about generating knowledge. So maybe some sort of like information metrics can be useful here. It happens um, over time. So it's a non-equilibrium process. So we need to, uh, it's not that I jump from the problem formulation directly to the answer. There is some sort of intermediate steps that, that need to be involved. Uh, and we need a language to describe those steps. And there is decision-making and decision-making is very similar to freezing degrees of freedom. Like for, for some of the degrees of freedom in my design problem, I want to just fix them in a particular place and ask what happens to the rest of the degrees of freedom. And um, with this kind of mapping between design and, and uh, sort of physics ideas, we can start trying to, to do something more um, quantitatively organized. And we start with this very old principle of maximal entropy statistical mechanics that uh, dates back to like Edwin Jaynes back in, in, in the 50s uh, was uh, doing this connection. Um, and the idea is we want to choose the least informative random choice of design alpha. And you do it by picking the state at random from a probability distribution that maximizes Shannon entropy. So we can write down, um, oh yeah, so Shannon had happened to be actually uh, working at University of Michigan some years ago. At University of Michigan, there is still uh, this very nice broad statue of him. Here is in 2020, Claude Shannon is, is also hiding from the COVID pandemic. Um, Thank you, Paul Shannon proposed to us this uh, functional form uh, that should be familiar to people who have, who have seen it before, but the idea is you have regular minus some P log P, that is uh, the amount of entropy, the, the, the amount of uh, uncertainty that you have in your probability distribution that you need to uh, sum over all feasible design, uh, the probability of picking each design, each solution, each state of my system, um, that I a priori don't know. I'm trying to write down entropy as a function of the probability distribution. And then this uh, rest of stuff is I'm trying to pursue several objectives in my design. So some sort of quantified version of all these objectives that uh, that are part of my assignment that the people in conference room gave me. And typically, the number of objectives is much smaller than the number of possible designs. Uh, it's, it's sort of similar to the number of forces you would have. You would try to pursue you know, two, three, four, five objectives but not millions. Um, and uh, in order to enforce um, those objectives, uh, I'm going to, well, in, in mathematics terms, I'm applying Lagrange multipliers. In, in physics terms, I'm going to call them design pressures, which is sort of generalized 
pressures, like how strongly do I want to pursue uh, each of the objectives? Um, just like in any other thermodynamic system, you can have several different generalized thermodynamic forces acting on your system. So uh, overall, this, this constraint says that your design objectives are reached on average in the ensemble, and you can uh, basically use either this average or the design pressure uh, as independent variables in, in the description uh, of your ensemble. And once you maximize this uh, Shannon entropy, you get the Boltzmann distribution, which is very familiar for us everywhere else in statistical physics. Uh, once you have Boltzmann distribution, you start applying any other statistical physics tools that, uh, that you might know, and, and you need to apply a loop of them. So you can compute ensemble averages, you can look for phase transitions, do coarse graining, map out effective forces, uh, look for emergent localization, all kind of stuff uh, that I'm going to be kind of light on math, but it's it's all uh, backed up in the, in the papers. So uh, let me give you a very simple example of um, what happens in the design problem. So imagine my design problem, I have a box, a square box, L by L size. I have two functional nodes that I need to put somewhere in this box called A and B, and I need to connect those nodes. I need to draw like a cable or, or a pipe or, or a corridor between them. and the, 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 this cable can only go vertically or horizontally, or equivalently, I only use Manhattan distance between the nodes. So, so I cannot draw it in a straight diagonal line. I can only go in little chunks of horizontal and vertical steps, but I always want to be on the shortest path. I don't want to, the, the path to be any longer than necessary. So the, the cost, the design objective uh, that I'm pursuing is basically just some, some constant prefactor times delta x plus delta y, so, you know, absolute values of delta x and delta y. The further away my two points are from each other, the more it costs. But then I'm going to um, sort of modulate this cost by a design pressure, like how much do I care about this cost? And I can define it in, in terms of one over TA. It's basically because uh, we like in physics to talk in terms of inverse temperature. So here I'm going to talk, uh, and we like the letter T because temperature starts with T. So we're going to use cost tolerance because tolerance also starts with T. Cost tolerance basically behaves like temperature. So it, it tells me how strongly do I want to select for lowest cost solutions as opposed to other solutions. Um, and I can actually uh, sum over all of the individual paths that exist between two particular endpoints uh, and compute what is the effective free energy if I sort of coarse grain the system a little bit. Now I don't care about specific paths, I just care about the endpoints. All the, all the shortest paths have exactly the same meanings. But there's a whole bunch of different points. So my uh, sort of effective free energy is this energy term minus temperature times the, the entropy term. Uh, what does this practically mean? Uh, let me try to compute what is my average cost in, in this design problem against the temperature for systems of several different sizes. So my, my cost tolerance here is, is uh, a free parameter. That, that I can scan over. So a priori, I don't know how much I care about cost. I want to know what happens if I vary how much I care about the cost. And then my um, average cost follows this sort of sigmoidal S-shaped curve. And as I go from some blue curve to green curve, it means I just go to a bigger system and this transition becomes much, uh, much sharper. In thermodynamic limit, it would actually not become infinitely sharp because in thermodynamic limit, my prediction function would just divert. It, it would be like a, a zeros order phase transition, if you will. Fortunately, our ships are never infinite. Uh, nodes never get infinitely far from each other. So it's good enough for, uh, for those purposes. And the idea is if my um, cost tolerance or temperature is below some critical point, then I prefer my, my nodes to be very close to each other. They're connected by short paths. They're pretty cheap, but there's very few of them. If my uh, cost tolerance becomes high, I'm willing to put my nodes further away from each other. It costs me a lot, but there is way more options uh, where I can uh, place all of my nodes. And I can also compute all other sort of more classic uh, statistical physics observables. I can ask what is my uh, variance in the cost. So if I'm right at this critical temperature, my my cost, my variance in the cost peaks right at this critical temperature. If I ask what is the variant as uh, the relative variance, so divide variance by the average, that decreases uh, monotonically down. So uh, if I want to have solutions that is very cheap, I'm going to be very uncertain about the, the relative cost of it. The only way to be very sure in what the cost is is to have a very expensive solution. 
uh, and for a square box, you can do some combinatorics uh, and, and, and play around with counting arguments and find actually what is this critical point. And this critical point is one over logarithm of two. And here two comes specifically from the fact that I'm in two dimensions. If I were in a, in a cubic box, then it would be logarithm of three. So one over log three is a slightly smaller number. If I were in one dimension, it would be log one over logarithm of one. Logarithm of one is zero. So it would be like an infinite transition of temperature. So there is no phase transition in one dimension because in one dimension, there is only one shortest path between any pair of points. So there is no sort of combinatorial explosion uh, that would happen. May I interrupt you? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, this previous slide uh, applied to a specific uh, design for sheets. Uh, so th this is a very or, or this is just uh, qualitative. Th this is uh, sort of a toy problem, right? But in in ships, it's sure, sure, sure. But in a sense, it's you you have built up uh, straight. I mean, uh, uh, a clear analogy uh -huh. between uh, your design problem uh -huh. and uh, statistical mechanical uh -huh. problem. Ruled by by the usual entropy expansion, uh -huh. and um, you have um, uh, in these blocks a critical point, uh -huh. and then I'm just curious. You have therefore two phases uh -huh. of the tolerance, uh -huh. and I'm curious to see uh, for the design of chips uh -huh. what is the High tolerance space and what is the low tolerance space? Uh, yeah, so uh, the way you for can a magnet, I know, mm -hmm. but for a ship design, uh, so the the low tolerance space is when you really want to have minimal cost. You, you want to have all the connections being as short as possible, and you know that you're depriving yourself of many design options. You will have very low flexibility of solutions you have to like in order to have minimal cost you need to do exactly this you need to put nodes very close to each other yeah together they can be in different parts of the ship but they have to be very close to each other so if you have some sort of constraint that comes later on in design to this it's not to rest, uh, the restriction seems to be i mean you actually are going to have uh, order spins and disorder spins as the two phases. Uh, so the way the way I read mm -hmm. the analogy, mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know whether design of ships so, actually comply with the with the two phases of uh, Disorder spins and uh, spins. so maybe a better analogy is not exactly ordered and disordered spins because spins don't move around in space. No, no, no. A, a simpler analogy is imagine you have two atoms at low temperatures they won't bind together in a molecule, at high temperatures they want to split up and and go travel around as individual atoms. I don't want to take uh, yeah. your time uh, mm -hmm. really on, um, but but the, so the flow of the mm -hmm. of your seminar, but. Um, but what I can see is that you produce a, a fixed analogy mm -hmm. because you use uh, entropy maximum principles mm -hmm. and the constraints and, and mm -hmm. so on. And then your configuration of the space is your design space. Yes. And then you have uh, distributions, probably distributions, mm -hmm. that decay exponentially, mm -hmm. uh, except perhaps you have power loss at this critical point. Uh -huh. it's, it's notable that you, uh -huh. you actually end up with the with the phase transition and the phases. Uh -huh. um, is it not too bold to take a problem which belongs to engineering uh -huh. to design of ships? Uh -huh. And in case it uh, with a two field uh, thermodynamic problem, uh, I think of it not as restricting, I think of it as liberating actually. Uh -huh. 
because they more in engineering, they would much more often frame it as an optimization problem. An optimization problem means you, you say, here is my cost, give me minimal cost. I don't care about anything else. Give me one place that has minimal cost and I don't care yeah, what else. No, I, I follow mm -hmm. it, but you have a precise analogy. Yeah? Uh -huh. you, the, the, you, the temperature is the tolerance. Uh -huh. Yeah, I still don't know which is the uh, going to play the role of the external field or the chemical potential. Ah, you are going to talk about the chemical. Potential. Chemical potential is going to come in the second part. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. On a different problem. Ah, a different problem. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to take your time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so so maybe it will become a bit more clear after I go to a slightly more complicated example. Basically, yeah. I needed to give you. You know, in physics, we start with one particle in a box. Here, we start with two particles in a box. But we want to go to more particles in a non-square box in a second. But basically, what uh, if we start looking at this effective free energy field, and I want to take negative gradient of it, I want to know what is the what are the forces that are moving my nodes around. So on one side, I have uh, my my cost pressure. So imagine I, I pin down one node in the bottom left of this graph. And the second node explores different positions in this graph. So I can draw like a vector field of forces, right? In order to minimize this cost, my nodes attract to each other. The closer they are to each other, the lower the cost they want to attract. On the other side, I have this effective emergent flexibility pressure in physics language, I would call it entropy pressure, um, that, that pushes the node apart, right? The, the more flexibility I want to have, the further away I need my nodes to be. And it's also not isotropic, it, it's primarily sort of pushes away along the diagonal. So if I uh, draw my uh, sort of level sets of, uh, of like one, this free energy at different temperature points, then if my temperature is very low, then there is clearly a minimum and uh, sort of in bottom left corner. So my nodes are very close to each other. And then I increase temperature and, and my nodes are willing to go a bit further away from each other. If I sit at exactly critical temperature, then my free energy is the same along this whole diagonal. So I'm equally happy to be at any distance along the diagonal. That's why there is so much fluctuations, right? It's, uh, it, it, it's like a floppy mode that, that we talked about earlier, right? So, so they, they can freely move anywhere along the diagonal. If I want to be at uh, a high temperature, my nodes kind of like unbind from each other and they go very far from each other. They go to opposite ends of the box. So they want to be as far from each other as the box allows them to be. If I if I didn't have a boundary of the box, they would fly away to infinity, and that would be bad, and you know my my integrals would diverge and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but that was a motivational problem. What we are actually interested, of course, is designing more complicated stuff, uh, figuring out how this sort of basic idea of of the uh, cost entropy transition manifests itself once our system becomes more complicated. So. Uh, have two main complications, and there's a lot of interesting stuff happens when both of them apply at the same time. On one side, here, imagine I have seven different nodes now, and they're connected pairwise along a particular network. Someone gave me this network. I'm not allowed to average over it. It's not drawn from ensemble. Someone gave me this network. These are the things that have to be connected by pipes or cables or something else. On the other side, I, I need to consider my, my physical architecture aspects. I have my ship hull. Everything needs to sit inside the hull, but it has very particular shape. Because I was hanging out with naval engineers, they taught me how to draw the boat shape, and, and, and we decided to stick with it. It's, it's not a square. It's not a rectangle. It's something with weird boundaries. And we need to figure out what, what would happen in between, what patterns, what arrangements uh, of, of these functional nodes would appear in the ensemble of all possible, you can call it graph embeddings. There's many possible ways to take this network and stick it uh, into the space. <clears throat> and I need to figure out how to how to even start computing something like that. So basically, because I'm, I'm trying to do statistical physics, a lot of computations that I need to do look like this. I want to compute what is my partition function. Uh, so I need to uh, take outer sum over all possible locations of every node. And inside, I have product of this sort of two-point Boltzmann factors between each pair of nodes that is connected in my network. In this case, I have seven nodes. And the way I drew the ship, I have 72 possible locations where each node can be. So I have 72 to power 7 different states, which if you convert to decimal, is 10 to power 13 terms. That's some big, ugly sum. That's a very large number of states that, well, usually you, you would 
try to solve something like that with Monte Carlo and like solve like search for a small subset of um, of all these different um, states, but maybe we can do something more clever. And also, apart from just getting the partition function, I might also want to know marginal distributions. I might want to know what if I sum over all but one of my nodes, and the one I want to know what's the marginal distribution on that. And there is no symmetry in this problem. There is no sort of combinatorial symmetric arguments that I can exploit to make this computation simpler. I need to figure out how to do it numerically. And uh, I figured out how to do it using this uh, trick called Tensor Networks. Tensor Networks were originally proposed by Roger Penrose in like 1971 for very obscure mathematical uh, problem. They're very useful and very mentorial questions. You might have heard about Tensor Networks in context of quantum condensed matter, where they're used to express sort of approximations of entangled Fourier functions. But here I'm using Tensor Networks in a very classical case. Uh, so I basically map, uh, so the topology of my network of tensors is exactly the same as topology of my uh, original network. I have two types of tensors. So each node now is a tensor, like a multidimensional matrix. The rank of the tensor matches the, the degree of the node, so the number of outgoing edges. So for instance, my um, uh, node number six has three neighbors. So this uh, side tensor uh, number six also has three legs going out of it. It's a rank three tensor. So all the green tensors are like Kronecker delta. Like they, they have one on the diagonal and zero everywhere else. They just make sure that each neighbor of this node sees it always in the same state, but I have to sum over all possible states. And then because I have two-point interactions, then I have uh, those gray tensors. They're kind of like coupling tensors. They're very similar to transfer matrices that we use in a uh, solution of certain uh, statistical physics problems. Most commonly, how, how do you solve like one deizing model? Uh, use transfer matrices. Here, transfer matrices are just hooked up to each other in a weird topology uh, order. And um, this formalism actually allows us to ask a whole array of different questions. So uh, this original network, it, it prescribes me in what order I need to uh, contract all the tensors. I can perform contractions in any order. Answer is always going to be the same. Uh, because this network doesn't have any external legs, it's going, uh, the number of external legs is preserved in all contractions. Here it is zero. So if I contract this network, I get the tensor of rank zero. So I get one scalar number, which in this case is going to be the partition function of my system. But I can also start messing around a little bit with topology. I can uh, start doing things like, oh, let me put a couple external legs on nodes zero and three in order to extract what is a marginal distribution over nodes zero and three. I can start uh, pinning down some of the nodes. I can say, okay, if node number one is pinned to be in a particular location, what happens to all of the other nodes? And I can start playing around with, uh, with the coupling, sort of the contents of this transfer matrices. And that allows me to, like, and then I can combine these techniques in, in different ways in order to ask questions about different patterns that, that happen in this um, arrangement case. So um, here's one example. <clears throat> Imagine I want to reserve some space in my ship. I, I want to reserve this two by two void in which I cannot place anything because I anticipate there will be components that I need to add later that will have to go there. But I want to know how much does it cost to reserve this space, which is similar to, you can think of it as like real estate price if you wanted to uh, you know, buy a plot of land in Mexico City, depending on where you want to buy this plot of land, it's going to cost you a very different amount uh, of money. So we wanted to sort of quantify it in a similar way uh, by considering all locations along this uh, central line. So here I'm, I'm uh, thinking about it in like very coarse grain terms. I don't care where any individual node goes. I only care about how much it costs me to compute this void. So I do it by I compute partition function without the void. I compute partition function with the void. And a negative log of, of the ratio actually gives me the, the cost of the void. It's, it's equivalent to free energy difference between state with a void and state without a void. Um, but then I can vary my, my temperature, right? I can vary uh, like which, which phase I'm in. So if I uh, prefer low cost solutions, so, so temperature is uh, subcritical one is, is a subcritical temperature. So my nodes on average want to attract to each other. So they want to hang out as a cloud somewhere in the middle of the ship, which means that my, my cost, my void premiums that I have to pay 
to put the void in the middle of the ship is going to be very high, but it's very cheap to reserve space on, on either side. Uh, and, and this is kind of like a, a, a symmetry break-in type uh, problem. So it's very cheap to, to reserve space at the front of the ship or in the back of the ship, but expensive in between. So, so these two uh, sort of states are disjointed from each other. There's like an energy barrier between them. But then I start adding, um, adding to my temperature, get it higher and higher, and eventually I transition to this high flexibility regime. And in high flexibility regime, uh, you can say that my uh, my nodes principally want to hang out in opposite ends um, of the ship. Uh, and there's much less density of the nodes in the middle. So now suddenly the, the, the land in the very middle is, is cheap, which actually happened in you know, a couple, couple cities historically, uh, where center is somehow much cheaper than, than the periphery. Uh, but we can we basically have a way to, to quantify this tendency. Um, Another thing that we can compute uh, is uh, the sort of emergent localization patterns. So as I mentioned, design is a non-equilibrium process. So there needs to be a sense in which I can be in the middle of design process. So imagine I pin down my nodes one, two, and six to be in very particular location. I'm not allowed to move them anymore, but I'm trying to figure out where do the other ones go. And I can uh, compute a, a quantity that uh, I call design freedom, which in physics would be called existence area. And this comes from the studies of Anderson localization and also studies of vibrational eigenmode localization uh, much more recently. So, so this metric was used from back in the 70s to like 15 years ago. Um, and again, I'm scanning across uh, cost tolerance and I'm drawing these curves of design freedom. And the intuitive way to, to interpret design freedom is if my marginal probability distribution of one node were uniform, how many, what, what fraction of space would it occupy? Would I be choosing roughly uniformly from all of the available space or from a very restricted um, area? Uh, and you can see that there is like a clear division between, between the different uh, sort of shapes of these curves. So if I look uh, at my uh, node number four, Node number four has no neighbors that have been pinned down. So it's the least constraint. So it can live basically wherever it wants. Its design freedom go, goes up as it's allowed to leave its neighbors. And then it just stays pretty high. And then there is nodes number, number three and number five, which each have one neighbor that has been anchored. So they are somewhat constrained. They have intermediate amount of freedom. And then there is uh, my last node number zero that only has three neighbors in the network but all three have been pinned down already. So it, it basically has nowhere left to go. So only if I'm at this intermediate cost tolerance, it has a little bump of freedom, but other than that, it's basically constrained. So I can uh, trace the effect of early design decisions on uh, later on where, where my placement goes. Um, and I can furthermore draw this uh, basically force field. So, so I can uh, say uh, for, for each of these nodes, if I drop it in a particular location, and I want to, to sort of do gradient descent optimization on it, I can compute what is the error, what is the gradient at each point. So I'm going to just keep going uh, down the gradient until I, I, I end up in the sort of best position. So we have this like, very detailed way to, to map out the uh, force fields in, in whatever complicated geometry uh, we have. Yeah, I'm curious, in the previous slide, what would be the thermal or statistical mechanical analog of your design freedom? Does it have to do with the... Uh... Uh, the closest... The fluctuation... The closest analogy would be this matrix of uh, Anderson localization. It's basically... So if you have uh, a pretty ordered material, you, you have wave functions that are delocalized, that are spread across the whole material. As you add disorder, suddenly you have localization and individual wave functions, like eigenfunctions, are confined to a very small amount of area. And, and so the, the talking about localization, the mm -hmm. divergence of the localization length. Yeah. Would be the analogy of design freedom. So so if you uh, look at the uh, definition, so in quantum mechanics, you're probability density square of yeah. the wave function, right? So here on the top, you would have sum over square of wave function, which is hopefully is normalized. So numerator should be one. On, in the denominator, you will have sum of the force power of the wave function. 
And if your wave function is only supported on a small amount of area, then you will get as the answer is this amount of area. So this is like the inverse participation ratio. Yeah, 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 basically. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess. As a whole power. I, yeah, I guess inverse. Right. Yeah, and I just like normalized it by the total error. Yeah, I, I think it's very similar in the participation ratio. Yeah. Um, so it vanishes. But uh, you were talking about the, I forgot, it was the, the, <coughs> the cost of this void. Mm -hmm. It was uh, high in the middle of the ship, and it was small at the edges. So, so th this is, I'm looking for a different pattern now. Th so this sort of this uh, result is independent of the voyage cost result. So this is, this slide is about if I place down three nodes, where do other four want to go? Because the system okay. yeah, has no, no symmetry and, and I need to sort of solve it in more brute force ways. Um, yeah, and then more recently we made this sort of uh, broader argument about uh, the, the emergence of, uh, of, of clusters because uh, very frequently in distributed systems, we, we kind of try to embed this network of things that are supposed to interact, but then they interact closely in physical space. An example would be, uh, you have your microprocessor, like we both have in our digital devices now, uh, where different transistors logically talk to each other and they might be talking to transistors on the other end of the chip. Uh, but the way the heat spreads, the heat follows heat equation, heat spreads locally. And your uh, performance of, of your whole uh, chip is limited by the hottest temperature. It, 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 if, if it heats too much, then you know it, it, it would shut down to, to prevent melting and people can actually map out these heat maps. And you can similarly map this uh, sort of weak points in workshop design. You don't want to put too much equipment in the same part of space because if you're attacked in that part of space, you lose a whole bit. And you have similar arguments for how congestion of airports works. Um, and we put this argument in, in, in this paper in archive recently uh, that basically you're, you're balancing this sort of cost and flexibility. And if you're, uh, if, if on the scale one side wins, then in either case you would have clustering. Either you have clustering driven by uh, by the nodes attracting to each other, or you have clustering driven by the nodes uh, that are repelling from each other, and and they nodes that are not connected find themselves close to each other. Or if you're right in the middle, then your attraction and repulsion almost balance each other out. Uh, but then you have very high variability. You're sitting right at that transition point. You have very high fluctuations of your design. It's much harder to commit to, to, to any particular design. Your sort of optimization landscape is suddenly much more flat. So basically, there is no free lunch for clustering, as in you cannot avoid clustering for, for, for zero cost. You, you kind of have to like choose your poison um, kind of thing. Uh, so to conclude quickly on this part of the talk, so, so I can say a few words in the second part of the talk, is that uh, this arrangement patterns can span two dimensions of architectural detail. Because now I have my network complexity that I worry about, and I have my spatial complexity, and there's sort of several orders of magnitude along uh, which each one can vary. Um, and usually when I talk about coarse graining in physics, you go from fine scale to coarser scale, coarser scale, coarser scale. So scale is used as, as sort of like a single parameter. You have only one axis. You can go from fine to coarse. But here suddenly I have two orthogonal dimensions in which I'm allowed to coarse grain. And uh, there's different, uh, so, so if I coarse grain every single way, then I just have my partition function and sum the way all degrees of freedom, nothing is left. But depending on how exactly I sum over my degrees of freedom, whether I care about space more or I care about network topology more, I can start asking uh, different questions that exist in the space sort of along the two different axes. Um, and we uh, found that sort of the, uh, the arrangement patterns that we discover have very close connection with the physical phenomena. So you have this solution flexibility becomes very similar to entropies that would happen in physical systems. Design stresses become like effective forces. Um, and this avoidance example I showed has uh, a lot of similarity to symmetry breaking and association uh, sort of through, through connection of new design decisions to the previous ones is following this emergence of holization. Uh, ideas. 
Okay, so so uh, so I'm going to to leave off from from the part about ships, even though there is uh, probably a few more things uh, that, that I have mentioned here. And I want to go to to my sort of newer work about uh, more data driven methods, which is a brand name, honestly, that, that we use at uh, Washington. And a very good uh, way to to motivate it uh, is this uh, recent op-ed paper by Nathan Kuz and Steve Brampton called Parsimony as the Ultimate Regularizer for Physics-Informed Machine Learning. And what they basically say is that, okay, we want to use this cool machine learning methods for learning stuff from data in order to learn something that is physical. And how, how do we do that? There is, in principle, two ways. Is that you let it learn whatever new representations it wants beyond human comprehension. That's how neural networks work. They decide by themselves where to spread the weights and activations and so forth. And it's really hard to post factum explain what neural network is doing. Or we can try to constrain uh, our understanding to, uh, to physics uh, that we know already. And the first of those people, uh, Nathan Kutz is one, one of my uh, advisors currently in Washington, uh, with whom we work. And uh, of course, they advocate in this paper today that it's not the rude that you want to to the physics constraints. Uh, as in one, when I showed up in this uh, group and, and in the group, no, basically nobody else has physics backgrounds, very few people. Uh, it's mostly engineers and mathematicians who use very different kinds of mathematics in, in, in their daily work. So I started asking questions about what this word means, what the word physics means to them, because the word physics means very different things for people with math degrees or engineering degrees. Because then physics means what is my ODE or PDE? What is dynamics, symmetries, conservation laws, but there's a whole bunch of other classes that they don't need to take. So they don't talk about physics in terms of energy landscapes and collective behaviors and phase transitions. And that is sort of the intuition that I uh, wanted to bring in. Uh, and the a very popular method that uh, they advanced uh, Stephen Mason and, and one of their colleagues back in 2016 is this idea of sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics or Cindy. And the idea is to have uh, some sort of trajectory, x of t, you have, you have observational data, you can differentiate it, you can find what is x dot of t. And you're trying to pull out what is the differential equations that govern this trajectory. So you, you want to know what is this x dot equals f of x. Uh, and you guess, you put an ansatz, that it is some sort of linear combination of nonlinear library terms. So this, this theta is a bunch of nonlinear functions of uh, of my coordinates that I just come up with, guess, and then I'm trying to find a vector of coefficients that is sparse. Sparse meaning most of the entries in that vector are zero, only a few specific ones are non-zero. And a uh, very popular specific uh, example of it, uh, the, the everyone's favorite benchmark in this Cindy world is a Lorentz system, which if you write down equations, looks exactly like this. Uh, you have uh, my derivative equals small nonlinear combination, just like we have very few forces acting on the right hand side. They can be nonlinear, but it's pretty sparse. So basically, you compute derivatives, you compute a whole bunch of this um, library terms, and then you're trying to find a sparse combination. And they figured out how to find, uh, like, what is the method of finding a sparse combination? There was a particular numerical method in there. So you can reconstruct what the equation was by just looking at trajectory. Um, and then once you know this, the, this reconstructed equations, you can integrate them forward and, and predict that the shape of this factor is, uh, is you know, the qualitatively is the same as what your training data. But an important um, disclaimer to make here uh, is uh, when I say integrate forward, what it means for me today, I just call like a Python function, you know, OD int, Here's initial condition, here's time, go forward, computer does it for me, because it's very easy. Uh, back when you know Lorentz attractor was discovered, it was not that easy, it was much harder to do. Uh, so who was doing the integration of Lorentz attractor? It's it's called the Lorentz attractor, right? It's it's called after the person who wrote the paper. So you know, here is the, the, the paper published in 63. Very clearly there is a single answer. But if you scroll down all the way to the bottom of the paper, there's actually acknowledgments. They say special thanks due to Miss Ellen Fetter for handling the many numerical computations and preparing the graphical presentation of numerical material. So there was someone else, there was a woman who actually did all the numerical integration and all the plotting, but she didn't make it to the author list. 
And a, in a different slide, the earlier paper also by Lawrence, special thanks to uh, Mrs. Margaret Hamilton for you know, essentially similar work. Uh, as was a very, fairly recent couple of years ago article in Quantum Magazine about the hidden heterogeneous of chaos, about how a lot of this early numerical physics work was essentially done by women who were not getting the credit, even though a few years later, Margaret Hamilton was doing numerical integration for trajectories of the Apollo project to, to land rockets on the moon, which is you know pretty tricky to do numerical and, and they managed to do it. So I highly recommend you uh, go read it. Uh, but we can go back to, to Cindy now that, okay, now we're allowed to integrate things. Now, now we have standard packages that do that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, that was Cindy 2016 that I mentioned. There has been a lot of modifications, a lot of different flavors of it that uh, have come up since. Obviously, you can, instead of just finding ODs, you can find PDs. If you want to know spatial temporal dynamics, uh, you can find parametric PDs, all this kind of pattern formation uh, type equations that you can extract from the data. Uh, there's uh, a cool recent uh, advance of using weak form of uh, partial differential equations, which is handles noise a bit better. There is different ways uh, to discover the correct coordinates. So maybe the coordinates in which you observe the dynamics are not actually the best to, to reconstruct the dynamics. Maybe there's a better way to do it that you can do with uh, autoencoder neural networks or uh, papers on that. More recently, people started worrying about uncertainty quantification. So can I draw an error bar on my prediction of what this coefficient should be in the dynamics? And there was a way to do it through resampling, and then there was a way to do it using sparsifying priors uh, in a very computationally costly way, but, but, but still gives us some ideas. And a lot of the same arguments boil down to optimization. And uh, you optimize an, an objective uh, that consists of two terms. You're trying to fit the derivative. You're just trying to do like a least squares fit. <clears throat> Plus, you have some sort of sparsification. You have some sort of a, a, a p norm of the um, of my vector of coefficients. And this is something that's never talked to physicists. They didn't know what a sparsifying prior is. And the reason it, 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 it goes that way is because if you look at, uh, so promoting the, the, the adding this regularizer is equivalent to trying to find what is the best fitting value that is constrained within a, a sphere of a certain radius. And a sphere is defined with respect to a particular norm. So if it's a two sphere, it's like a circle, like, like a normal Euclidean distance. Um, and in that case, my, my coefficients that I find are going to be small. Uh, they're going to be close to zero, but they're not necessarily going to be sparse. But if I have a one norm, my coefficients are going to be small, but I'm likely to, to be on one of the axes of my sort of high dimensional sort of coefficient space. So I'm uh, going to promote sparsity uh, of of the coefficients that I identify. Uh, yeah, and but L1 still is a convex problem, which makes it simpler uh, for various reasons. So, and uh, this whole optimization question, again, remember I come at it from, from the ethos of arguing against optimization that is very reductive. If all you want is optimal solution, you miss out on a whole bunch of uh, other questions. And my main question was uh, how does Cindy break? Specifically, how does it behave as a function of? Uh, of the size of my data set, so how long it is, how frequently it's sampled, how much noise there is in the sampling of the trajectory, and also how strongly do I promote sparsity, and, and how do I, uh, what's my prefactor on, on this least square thing? And this is something we've been uh, pursuing with uh, Joseph Bakarji, who is uh, who was a recent uh, postdoc in our group, who uh, recently started faculty position at American University of Beirut in Lebanon in the Middle East. So we have a lot of exciting long distance impulse. Um, and uh, Chris Manohar, who is my other postdoc advisor at uh, Washington, who's in the mechanical engineering department. Um, and uh, so how much time do I have? I think we're hitting 12 o'clock. Mm, yeah, like one minute. Yeah. Please. Okay. Okay. So uh, doing it extremely fast. I frame this problem as a question of uh, Bayesian inference. I come up with the cleverest sparsity promotion prior. I figure out how to get the posterior distribution on all of the coefficients that you can uh, extract. There's a lot of interpretation that goes into it that you can compute all this free energies, get the, the friends of free energies for different solutions, uh, say that as my amount of data grows further and further, my 
solution is very confidently condensing on one particular answer, which is not necessarily correct. And then there is, here was the part about the chemical potential, where basically the sports city promotion is like chemical potential for adding more terms to my equation. Depending on how much terms I can add, I'm going to discover solutions of different sparsity and have very sharp uh, transitions between them. Uh, I can have uh, interesting pictures of how I gradually add more and more noise uh, to the system until the inference breaks down. Uh, I can actually produce all the um, error bars, or sort of confidence intervals of uh, how far my identified dynamics are from, from the correct dynamics that I was originally putting in, where we can distinguish between statistical error and systematic error. Uh, we can draw a phase diagram of how exactly does this inference break down. Uh, you, you can figure out that it breaks down if my sampling period gets too high, so I'm, my systematic error in numerical differentiation gets really bad, or in the other direction, if I have too much noise and, um, and I have sort of noise-induced breakdown uh, of this inference. Um, yeah, and basically, this, this going to a long trajectory limit is kind of like going to some dynamic limit, and we have this phase transition analogies, chemical potential analogies. There's a bunch of other things that can be done. Uh, so just to, to acknowledge a bunch of people who, who helped me, there is uh, a group of people on, on the design problem, starting with my PhD advisor, and that was mostly funded by Office of Naval Research in the States, uh, and then NSERC in Canada, after my advisor moved to Canada. On the other side, on the uh, Cindy side, and, and I had a, a sensors project, it's funded by National Science Foundation of the United States. Uh, and I use this uh, really cool scientific color maps, especially in the second project that, that uh, you should check out. And I use this really cool uh, font from Ukraine uh, to, to do all of the slides, um, which I uh, got permission to use from, from the author in exchange for uh, putting these fundraiser uh, links on my slides. And on that, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Lane. Um, do we have any questions in Espanol or in English? Yes, uh, regarding the tensor network, I understand when you use that to calculate partition functions. Mm -hmm. Technically, how do you use to do that uh, analytically by summing up a path, or is this purely computational? Uh, so it, it has something to do with what, what is the object? Yes, yeah, which is used for the calculation. Uh, yeah, so, so it's a numerical computation, and uh, it's the result of the contraction of tensor network, because it's just a big sum, uh, the result is always the same regardless of in which order you perform operations. But there's a very complicated computational aspect of it. Basically, you need to perform one summation at a time, but you need to decide on the order in which you're doing tensor contractions. If you choose the order wrong, then intermediately you create very large tensors that have a chance of not fitting into your memory and sort of dramatically expanding the, the amount of, of sort of CPU words that you need to do. So uh, under the hood, you need to figure out in what specific order do you need to perform those contractions. And if, you, uh, if I were always using the same exact tensor network topology, then I could figure out that order once and for all and then just regardless of what numbers form the standards, I can always do contraction in, in the same order. But in my case, because every next computation I do, I change my uh, tensor network topology a little bit. So I need to figure out that contraction order on the fly. Uh, and there's also implicitly high, high rank tensors can be approximated there with SVD. Uh, so single value decomposition, and then you uh, truncate a little bit of uh, like small single values. So you, you approximate the tensors uh, as well a little bit. And by uh, sort of combination of clever order of performing contractions and doing SVD approximations, you can do it pretty fast in the end. But basically, the difference between contracting in correct order or wrong order can be orders of magnitude, can be like factor of 100. Uh, but there is basically developed for, um, like open source code to, to do tensor network contractions for any purpose. There is a connection between, I mean, formally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of connection with, uh, for instance, the exact solution of the 2 d in model. Mm -hmm. You can uh, sum of a path or, or some uh, 
high temperature expansion the partition function that there are relationships between your tensor method and this uh, well known uh, method of approximation or exact method. Yeah, so a lot of the enumeration arguments, a lot of the combinatorial arguments, they rely on your system being highly symmetric and infinite. Like the reason you can solve, you know, two D Ising model using fast computations is because you know that your paths go arbitrarily far. And that at any scale, your system looks like an infinite 2D square grid, right? So, so you exploit a lot of that symmetry in order to, to build computations. And I needed to figure out how to do it without exploiting symmetry. So this is a much more brute force approach. It's more computationally involved, but it's less restricted at the same time. Um, Sorry for having taken no, it's great. It's great. part of your time and then you have to rush. It is great. Uh, just a general comment of what you presented because um, in the first part I saw a statistical mechanical formalism mm -hmm. employed mm -hmm. for a complex system mm -hmm. with design. Mm -hmm. And then whatever I captured from the second part, the Cindy, mm -hmm. it was um, um, already existing nonlinear dynamical problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, obtaining the trajectories, mm -hmm. and obtaining from the trajectories obtaining say information about the attractor because mm -hmm. this effective system. Then my general comment or question is if for complex systems where you have emergent properties mm -hmm. and you have uh, self-organization where perhaps second law mm -hmm. is, uh, is to be examined. Mm -hmm. If you work it was basically not to change in your applications, uh -huh. not to change statistical mechanical, uh -huh. statistical mechanics, and as it is, it was a traditional one. Uh -huh. It's all equilibrium. Not to here. change uh, uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh -huh. but use it uh, for complex system problem. Uh -huh. Do you think that is uh, more profitable than the opposite, which would be to change the formalism, generalize statistical mechanics mm -hmm. in order to answer basic questions of complex systems? Well, or nonlinear dynamics, take it as it is, as, as we have it. Mm -hmm. So the two different things, what I, so was you use the uh, traditional mm -hmm. the statistical mechanics for an unusual complex system mm -hmm. would not be necessary mm -hmm. for complex systems to, to understand complex systems. Mm -hmm. uh, to understand complex systems, uh, that it is needed to, to make changes in uh, say statistical mechanics or in nonlinear dynamics, the opposite of what you don't. Well, uh, we're not trying to solve for you know the most general possible complex systems. We need to sort of scope out for each problem that we're trying to solve. What what do I want to write a paper about? And you're right that sort of the basic intellectual framework of statistical mechanics, like how do you get to you know Boltzmann distribution partition function. Yeah, that is super standard. That is, you know, hundred year old textbook stuff. But uh, you know, over and over and over, we we are bogged down with the question. Let me get to raise my additional function definition. Like we end up staring at this question, right? How do you compute partition function? And every time you need to come up with a way how to compute it. And there are several ways. You know, you can do Enumeration, you can do combinatorics, you can do Monte Carlo, 
you can do um, midfield theory type approaches. Um, I came up with a way to do this computation the way nobody else has been doing it before, a different kind of approximation that we can talk about relative merits. Well, that's, that's true, but, but say without extending much, mm -hmm. but uh, a, even with some humor attached to it, uh, complex systems um, they very often have a scaling properties and have a show to us power loss as opposed to exponentials. Might as well. Of the logarithmic mm -hmm. function, function. And in your examples, uh, you um, you use traditional statistical mechanics uh, mm -hmm. or traditional nonlinear dynamical mm -hmm. problems like the Lorentz mm -hmm. uh, map. Uh, so there you have exponentials, <laughs> uh, whereas many problems in complex systems. Not in this one. I, I so picked problems. Do, 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 I'm, are, I'm bringing you yeah. away from, yeah. from your, uh, I shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a general comment. A general comment in this but you, you might do it like solar-centric and stuff like that. One can make a joke. Uh -huh. How do you recognize a complex uh, systems uh, uh, Pozok, uh -huh. because he's carrying uh, his data plotted in log log data, meaning it's is uh, complexity is power loss as opposed to exponential. Sorry, it was no, 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 no. it's not. Uh, I have used my time already. Currently mm -hmm. navigating this is very, it's very long time. Here is a bar of knowledge. <laughs> Since you were asking, it is, I granted it's an extremely simple power law, it's, it's power long, but we're, we're interested, very roughly speaking, on how does this resolution parameter, how closely do I fit the data, depend on how much noise I throw in. And either you're in the regime dominated by uh, numerical finite difference error of, of your derivative, or you're in the regime dominated by uh, noise, and um, and for well, for, for one of those regimes, I can I can predict what it should be. So that's that's a, the, the dashed straight line on a log log plot with power of one. But uh, yeah, there are many complex systems that that obey power law. So was, um, in in some of my other projects that I didn't mention here, there is much more sort of variation across many scales. Uh, of detail that, that marries power loss, but uh, it's at the same time, uh, it's very easy to get carried away uh, by power loss, especially because they're so easy to get that so many complex systems people, especially last 20 years, think like, oh, I came up with this fundamental model that gives me a power law. <clears throat> the exponent of power law matches the, the one that I see in experiment. Therefore, this is a correct mechanism. True. That's, that has happened. That has happened numerous amount that of time. That has happened. I was making a contrast so, with your approach, which was use a, a, a statistical mechanical formalism mm -hmm. that uh, it's only going to have power loss if you get a phase transmission, which you have. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it, it's very easy to, to be carried away by power loss. And because complex systems community have been learning it for 25 years, the so-called artificial intelligence community have been learning it for about half a year. Now they are very excited about power loss and they treat them as dumb as we did 25 years yeah. ago. They think we see power law, therefore it's universal, therefore something is amazing, except for their argument is give us more data. Let's just take the entirety of internet, stick it into ChatGPT, because ChatGPT has power loss. Oh my God, who could know? Except for now they want to extrapolate and like, let's mm, take all of the internet that we have. Let's take however much electricity production we have on the planet, stick it on ChatGPT, but it will have with diminishing power law, diminishing returns, it will give you slightly better answers after eating the rest of the planet. So that's where power loss is taken down. They're 
because they're very early in the process, they don't realize it. Uh, which hopefully in complex systems community people have been thinking about it for for longer. And uh, um, I'm interested often in so power laws often refer to some sort of universality of underlying process. And I'm interested in complex but less universal behaviors. Thanks for it, Kai. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My question is about these. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The third one is Do you have any problems with these or the solutions of the landscape of solutions? These in the tensor network, do you have these problems or over determined or less determined? And if they, if they present the phase transition itself, the tensor network? Uh, so, well, tensor networks can be uh, used to count all of the states in which your system can be. Uh, and there, in a way, so in, uh, in, in spin glasses, I assume that's sort of where, where you uh, leading to, uh, you can have the, the break of ergodicity, right? Where you, your solution gets confined to like a, a sub part of, of your whole configuration space. It cannot, like thermal uh, um, fluctuations can, cannot let it escape some subset of, uh, of all of the configuration space. Therefore you need to come up with, you know, different, all, all this like overlap metrics and, 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 and so forth. Uh, tensor networks are the way I use it. In a way, they're like dumber. Like they don't consider that you uh, that some states might be thermodynamically accessible from other states. They just I assume that I am in equilibrium. I don't worry about whether I'm, I can relax to equilibrium. I assume that any state is reachable with probability equals to whatever Boltzmann formula tells us. So in that way, I I don't have an ergodicity breaking problem, but if the the systems that you were concerned about had such issues, then I I think you could look into it with with tensor networks. This leads me to my other question. I would like to know what is the impact shift design of this work, especially because if you look at the ships, if you go for example to Port of Veracruz. Uh -huh. And you will see that all, let's say, the liners that take cars have the same shape. Oil tankers, they look the same. Or warships, they look the same. So it seems like everybody falls into the same kind of design. Uh, in, in, in a way, because if you go to a port, if you don't have security clearance and you're not allowed to enter inside of that ship, you see the ship from the outside. From the outside, the ship is governed by hydrodynamics. Like how how does it go through through the water? How does water flow around it? And that we kind of figured it out. I don't think there is. I, I, I mean, they they keep trying to incrementally improve it by using you know more complicated hull shapes, different materials. But what you don't see is how equipment is arranged inside of the ship. And I am not interested particularly in uh, the the shape of of the ship hull because that is basically pretty strongly constrained by hydrodynamics. What I am interested in is what happens inside of the ship and specifically whether you have the sort of clustering vulnerabilities, like how close uh, to each other are different pieces of equipment uh, located because there have been many sort of emergent design failures that could not have been anticipated. Uh, a particular example that our Naval Engineering collaborator uh, gave us there's in the middle of the ship there is a dining hall so all the you know seamen go there to to have their lunch and dinner and whatnot and right through the dining hall there is a giant pipe with jet fuel that goes through the dining hall which you would think that's probably not a very wise thing to do because it is it is a very vulnerable thing jet fuel is you know very explosive flammable uh, kind of thing you would want to put it somewhere uh, away from the, where there is a large concentration of people on the ship. So therefore you need to uh, sort of think in different term of um, how to arrange equipment inside your ship. And that is that is sort of the direction which we were trying to push. So let's say that you will have some terms that will take into account the pipeline inside 
Yeah, 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 you can for example so start going towards that. So you can derive in this kind of approach. Uh yeah, and a lot of it is uh comes from people being very committed to optimization problem in one way, but at the same time they, they try to partition this problem into chunks. There are like different teams that work on different systems on the ship that don't particularly talk to each other. And each of the teams says, this is the best thing for me. And this is the best thing for me. The best thing for us is to have dining hall here. And the best thing for us is to have a pipe with jet fuel going through it. And, and, and that is what, what comes in the final uh, design. And we're trying to bring the sort of more holistic view of uh, like, let's put in all the design objectives. And sometimes so the yeah, yeah. The hydrodynamics, I mean, the revolutions are precisely outside that solutions. Because, for example, you said that the hydrodynamic is not important, but I read that the most important revolution the last year is precisely the bow of the ships. There are they started to have the well, that, that depends on what, what, what materials are you reading. I assume you don't read too many naval engineering journals, neither do I. I hear what my collaborators tell me, and they would say that the most important thing is moving to all electric ships. Uh, that's a major thing that makes us rethink all of the architecture inside. Before we had an electrical generator and a diesel engine, or maybe like a nuclear engine that, that powers motion of the ship and an electrical system that powers all other systems, right? But now there is just a single generator that powers both the electric motor and all other equipment you have in the ship. But now you have a lot more different things to, to consider. You need to consider much more like power distribution and, and, and how to go to this all electric setup, they would say that is her efficient. Or if you go to warships, now it's clear after the war in Ukraine, it's better not to build ships at all. Oh yeah. So the, the, the next and thing is, at, is, 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 yeah, it is. You spend uh, a whole, yes, it is. Pay a lot of money for building a ship and then you can sink it with a drone, very cheap drone. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. I'm. I'm very happy that Ukraine is winning the naval battle without having a navy. But that's a different question. We can continue. As it please. Yes. And in your holistic approach, okay, you're talking about ship mm -hmm. and uh, you have systems or subsystems, right? Mm -hmm. And then you the good point about your approach is that you see the whole thing together. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. I imagine that. And that approach is very good in biology. For example, the cell, uh -huh. very simple. Uh -huh. as simple as possible. Then it would be nice to test no? uh -huh. all this holistic approach to see with the old restrictions if the cell has been uh, produced revolution in uh -huh. the optimal way. Uh -huh. You have a test of the, of the evolution. Evolution makes, makes uh, some uh, living things. Uh, yes, but evolution works much faster when you talk about cells. The reason is because cells are very tiny. I know of many uh, biophysics labs that can do evolutionary experiments because the generation time is like 20 minutes, right? So in a day, you can run evolution experimentally like 100 generations forward, no problem. Uh, so the bigger your uh, organism gets, the slower evolutionary time scales are. If your organism is on the scale of a naval ship, like human lifetimes, or you know human civilization history is not enough long enough to to run that kind of uh, evolution. Of course, there are uh, sort of evolutionary inspired computational algorithms, all those genetic algorithms, all this stuff uh, that that tend to provide such uh, solutions. So. I can also sort of try to, to separate my approach of questions I'm asking here, because I'm asking questions as a physicist, and I'm trying to give answers that are also interesting to physicists of what are the, the basic physical phenomena that, that happen here. Engineers would be much more interested in give me a solution, give me the thing that works, tell me what I need to build. Um, and I think it's a probably much longer time scale problem to, to sort of bridge this aspects. But I can say that uh, I don't know anyone who was working on this sort of design problems, especially in ship context before 
we started working on it, but there's sort of only so much we can do about it in, in scope of one PhD. Uh, like there is like a short stack of papers that I managed to write, find a few things. I hope they were fun. I hope you, you got it. I hope it sort of convinced you that there are interesting physics questions to, to look for here. But also, if I were to talk about this uh, ship design problem to a fully engineering audience, I would I would be talking about it differently. Uh, because the, the things that engineers find interesting are different from things that physicists find interesting. Okay. Um, well, not quite the same. Thank you.